Hello, and welcome to Voices of the West. Today we are being joined by Glenn Bruce, screenwriter, novelist. Oh boy, you've gotten numerous awards on all kinds of things we can start with here. But uh, Glenn, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into Westerns, or eventually there. Uh, Kevin, I've lost you again. Oh, there we are. Okay. I'm right here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Technology. No worries. So uh, that's a, actually a, a weird and kind of interesting story, at least to me. I was, um, I, I, I went for my MFA late in life, about 10 years ago. And uh, my ex-wife, just before we separated, said, hey, let's go on a, a cruise. So we'd been on a few. <clears throat> so I found a nice two-week one, which had several days at sea, which was fabulous. I, did, I didn't think I'd like it that much, but oh my gosh, it was great. So I wrote a lot. And one of the things that popped in was this idea for a Western short story, which I had never had any, you know, interest or desire or relationship with Westerns. But this idea came in that was a, a kind of a neat, ironic story. Uh, I called it, he rode from Natchez. Natchez. And uh, I wrote it, you know, over a few days at sea. And then, uh, you know, I handed it in for one of my MFA assignments and it went well, and people liked it, blah, blah, blah. Cut to several years later, I thought, you know, this might make an interesting screenplay because that's my background. And uh, so I wrote the screenplay. I had to expand it a little, you know, because it was a 10,000 word short story, something like that. And I uh, liked it. I mean, it just, it, it flowed out well, it turned out well. So a little after that, I decided maybe I should novelize it. So then I did that. I think it came in about 46,000 words. And uh, I was looking around for where to submit it and I found DSP and, um, you know, sent it in and I said yes and now, 10 novellas or nine novellas like total of 10 here we are yeah <laughs> very much <laughs> yeah it's been fun you know it's been fun it's different it, you know i'm 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 not a i write in genres often and i'm i'm comfortable writing you know doing genre writing but i always try to do something different um i don't necessarily follow all the tropes which maybe isn't as popular with hardcore readers of any genre but um I, I develop my own following because they are uh, different. My, you know, my books are slightly different. I like to get into the personal aspects of, of the characters. Mm -hmm. So give them a richer life outside the, the trope or the design of the story, the genre. Uh, so we know who they are, what they are. And that always leads to other characters and to other situations that aren't necessarily uh, germane to the genre. Uh, so in, in the case of the, the He Road series here at DSP, um, I had him kind of fall in love early on and I made her a cowgirl and she appeared in two, uh, let's see, number, I think in number two and number three. And then she comes back in number 10 to complete the circle. To finish everything off, yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. She 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 reappears. Uh, I knew all along that was going to be it, going to be the end one, but it ended up being a bigger challenge than I thought it would be because it still has to be in the genre and it still has to be about Hancho, the, the lead character, but he's dead at that point. So how do you make that work? And I... <laughs> You know, it took it took a lot of work to make it work, but I really like the way it turned out. It's it's tragic and ironic. It keeps the tone of the series, the irony of the series. Mm -hmm. It brings in family. There's a whole thing about family right from the beginning. Um, how important family is to him, even though he's estranged and goes off on his own thing. Uh, how he relates back to his family in Natchez when he was a kid, and how it evolves over the period of time and he develops kind of an offbeat family with a woman he rescues and how then she and the old girlfriend you know come together in the last episode to be friends and to um, avenge his killing mm -hmm. 
So the whole full circle thing, and you know, that's, that's more what I try to do to make it, you know, a little more interesting than, than the usual tropes. Yeah. And you have very strong female characters leading up the entire last part. And that's a beautiful thing always. Yes. I, I, I like to do that. I, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a son he doesn't know about, there, you know, there's all kinds of neat things that add to it without it being soapy. I don't, I, you know, I'm not a fan of melodrama. <laughs> so there's, there's no melodrama in it. Although there may be a few poignant moments, but it, there's, there's no melodrama, but it, it but it is, uh, it, it wraps up that whole journey that he's been on in life, as well as just, you know, you know, cattle rustlers and floods and you know, cougars, wild cougars in the mountains and gold and all that stuff that he goes through, which is all fun. And even those, you know, I, I tried to make them a little bit different um, to, to find some thread in those, those threads within the story that, maybe approaches it from a slightly different angle and to mm -hmm. me makes it more interesting. I mean, I hope readers think the same thing um, because I want to take them on a slightly different journey within the customary journey. <laughs> Getting all the appropriate trappings, but in completely different twist on it. Yes. <laughs> if I can. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and it's, it's not always easy to do that. You know, you, you don't want to alienate readers who like a genre. But I think, you know, what I've found in talking, you know, to my fans, uh, such as they are, um, they're, you know, they like that. They, they, they always say, you know, there's something, something different about it. There's something interesting that I wasn't expecting. It goes in a, in a direction I wasn't expecting, and that kept me reading. And that's, you know, that's my job. Absolutely. 100% on that. Yeah. How did you feel the overall change comes from going from being a screenwriter into doing the novelizations like this? I mean, I know you've done it for a whole bunch of different types of genres and everything, but speaking specifically on Westerns, it's a different animal to write a book than it is to write a screenplay. Yes, it is. Um, in fact, you know, in, in pursuing agents, literary agents, I ran across one uh, a, a woman agent who'd been around a long time. And she said something like, screenwriters do not contact me. <laughs> so she definitely, <laughs> she definitely didn't like the way screenwriters write novels. And, and, but you know, I learned something from that. I thought about, well, what, is she, what does she mean by that? So one, one of the things that's different, in fact, I was watching um, Mrs. Davis last night, mm -hmm. the, the Peacock series uh, with uh, Gilpin and Betty Gilpin. And, there's a scene where uh, they're at the monastery and they hear something and they look up and it's a helicopter coming. Then it cuts to a POV from the helicopter looking down. Well, you can't do that in a novel. You can't head hop. You can't change POVs in a novel because it, it, it disorients the reader when they're not used to it. It, it, it. The only way it can work is if, you know, you make a break. Mm -hmm. and, it wouldn't be worth it for that little shot, but you can do that in movies all the time. You can show reactions of people after people leave a room, for instance, which you would never do in a novel. Um, there are ways kind of to imply it or the, the character that, whose POV it has been looks back and sees it happen, but you can't switch POVs. So there are little things like that that are different. Um, you know, sometimes the pacing is different, but, um, one of the things I learned from writing screenplays is pacing, is how to keep it going, how to keep it moving, how to keep the audience expecting the next thing and waiting and how to how to pace your action and break it up with, you know, some humor. That's the other thing I do that maybe some writers don't do as much as I do is to add a lot of humor. I like a lot of humor in anything I'm writing. I write very dark thrillers. They all have humor. In, them. in fact, probably the funniest thriller I have is an FBI serial killer thing where the guy's just horrible, but there's a lot of humor. In it. So I, I brought that into the, to the Westerns. So that's one thing. Um, so there's a lot you can learn from screenwriting and apply to novels. You just have to figure out what the differences are, some of which I've, I've noted there. Um, but the, um, the main thing is you get to explore uh, the you know the inner world of the right of the characters better 
screenplays, you're looking at it mostly, and novels, you're looking from within out. And Can't that's really a, write a script on what someone's thinking. <laughs> right. It's very difficult. You, you know, the, you may have to use voiceover, which is a terrible thing to do. You know, it's a last resort. So you don't want to do that. And, and uh, But in, in novels, yeah, you can go inside the character. You can express everything you want to through that character's eyes, what they're feeling, you know, what they're seeing, how they're responding to it. So all of that works. And it's so in that sense, it's, it's it's in a way it's more fun because it's less restrictive than a screenplay. Where a screenplay, I taught screenwriting for over twelve years at the university level. So you know, you, you the thing is, it's very specific. It, it, there's a there's a paradigm you have to follow. Uh, the model can't really be broken uh, very much. It can, but it, you're you know, it gets dangerous if you do that. Got to know uh, it before you can break it. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, and even that, it, breaking it's very dangerous in screenwriting. Whereas in novels, you have a lot more freedom. Um, but the one big plus I was going to say that I got out of uh, screenwriting moving to novels is the three act structure. Ninety nine percent of screenplays have a three act structure, so it's twenty five percent, fifty percent, twenty five percent. If I write a screenplay first, like in the case of of this series, of the He Road series, I've got that one part, two parts, one part, three act structure already in place. So when I go to write the novel, it serves as a, as a blueprint. You know, mm -hmm. I've got a map and I know where my story beats are going to be approximately and that they're going to, they're gonna follow the correct flow. Pacing's gonna be right. The turning points are gonna be where they're supposed to be. And the basic length of those acts is going to carry over from screenplay to novel. When you actually get to the novel and start working on it, it, it changes a little bit. You can fudge things that you can't fudge in a screenplay. Again, making it a little more fun. Um, but that structure, uh, if I write screenplay first, gives me a terrific roadmap for how to lay out the novel and then how to you know, massage it as I go along. Yeah, and you have all the dialogue done at that point too. <laughs> a lot, a lot of it. Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, it, it may change a little bit, but uh, a lot of times it's literal. I just take it from. In fact, I I copy and paste it, and, and you know I may adjust it a little bit or whatever. But uh, and you have to add your, um, you know, he says and she says to it. But um, it, it, a lot of it. Yes, a lot of the dialogue is written. And the, the novels are going to be a little bit longer. Um, I've, usually they end up being 40 to 45,000 words. Um, and they're fleshed out a little bit more the screenplay. If it was literal, they would probably be 35,000 words. But because things are established in the screenplay that I then want to expand mm -hmm. and I want to have more fun with and, and take them a little bit further, which I can in the novel, then they become a little bit longer because they're more fleshed out, but in a way they're more interesting. It's a, it's just a, it's a different, like you said earlier, it's a different medium. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. So what do you think makes a great Western, particularly dealing with that whole paradigm on everything? Yeah, I, I think the challenges of the era, um, because Basically, the you know human challenges are the same over all time. You know, it's it's survival, it's housing, it's food. You know, it, it it's emotional content and uh, context. So I think the uh, the Western gives you a, a very specific way to explore the human condition that you can't in other genres, which is kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, that, that I like to do that rather than just say, you know, he he rode after the outlaws and they had a gunfight and we go to something else. <laughs> but what's, he, what's he feeling? Why did he have to go? What's, what's you know, I, I like to put a lot of conflict because, you, you know, drama without conflict is a drama. Yeah, and hopefully most people don't just want to walk out there and shoot people. So yeah, there's got to explain why. <laughs> That's right. And those guys get shot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You, you want to shoot them. So, but the, but the, uh, the idea that um, the character may have 
internal conflict about the situation makes it much more interesting. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and ra rather than just by rote. So yeah, I think I think that it, it, Westerns are, you know, Elmore Leonard is one of my favorites. He's, he's just, his style of writing, I take to heart. You know, don't, don't use one extra word that you don't have to use. Mm -hmm. um, but he, uh, his, his 10 rules of writing, I don't know if you're familiar with those, are hilarious. Um, you, I read you, them long you, ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're, they're worth looking up. You know, it's, it's like, one of the, one of them is sort of like cut out the parts that people skip over. You know, so I, I'm a big fan of Leonard. And of course, he started with Westerns. That's, that's, that's how he got going. And he moved into, uh, you know, detective stuff, crime, noir. But his style uh, generally fits. I think I, I get into a little more of the emotional life of the characters than he did. Uh, maybe more like Robert Parker, his, his uh, detective stuff. But the... Um, the, you know, just the access to that time allows you to eliminate a lot of the junk that we deal with today. You know, if, mm -hmm. if you write a, a script or a novel or whatever today, you got to have cell phones in it. <laughs> you know, you, you've got to have computers in it. You've got to have now artificial intelligence. You've got to deal with all the things that we deal with today that are superficial. Whereas at that period of time, uh, those things were very limited. You yeah, know, that newfangled telegraph thing coming in, yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, uh, I started, let's see, I think it starts in 1865 and goes through 1888, this series. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a telegraph, basically, in the beginning. It was just coming yeah. on. Middle of it, especially, yeah. Especially out west. Um, but it was fun to read about. And, you know, that's the other great thing about it. Any, any period or area that you're writing about that you don't know a lot about, and by area, I mean geographical area, mm -hmm. um, or, or people or references, is doing the research. How um, much research do you put into being able to write one of these books? Tons. <laughs> tons. Yeah, I read, you know, I probably read as much as I write. And when I write, I end up doing five, six, 10 drafts of every, of everything I write. So yeah, I read a lot. I have, I have pages and pay, I have multiple sites <laughs> um, flagged, you know, bookmarked that I can go to, to look up all kinds of things about the period, about innovations and weapons and politics and, and, you know, statehood, I just all that stuff. If, if I don't know, how, for instance, uh, gold panners actually panned, I might spend a day just reading up on that just so that I get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, you don't use all of it. You, you know, maybe you use 1% of, of what you research, um, but that 1% is the 1% that you need to make it right. Yeah, you know? it's in your brain and it comes through. Yes. Exactly. Or, or you, you, you zero, just zero in on it and say, I want to use this one thing and then figure out how to use it, which is a little more difficult uh, because you don't want to just shove it in. You know, you don't want to shoehorn it into something where it shouldn't be, but you, 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 you figure out a way like, okay, I, I think I see how I, and then, it, you know, it takes some massaging, but yeah, I do massive, for everything I write, I do massive amounts of research. I just did a novel based on, uh, or said in Baltimore. I didn't know anything about Baltimore. I didn't even know I was writing about Baltimore until about halfway through. And I was like, oh yeah, this is set in Baltimore. So I had to go back and learn everything about Baltimore and start, start all over again. Uh, well, or add to it, and subtract certain things. But it's okay. the same thing with Western to you. You know, if I was, when I was writing about Northern New Mexico in 1880, I needed to know you know, what was going on in Northern New Mexico in 1880. And that's not something you just pull up one document and go, oh, I see. You know, I'm, I might read 10 or 15 or 20 different uh, tracts about the period and the time and the people and, uh, you know, how they lived, what they lived in. Why is Northern New Mexico different than, you know, Texas? 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're pretty close, but they're very different. So yeah, all, all kinds of, you know, and who, what, that was one of the interesting ones was the, uh, the different tribes. So, you know, we only think of Apache, Comanche, you know, Sioux, and, you know, within each one of those, there are, you know, it's, it's like uh, religion. There's a hundred different, or there's what, 3,600 or 4,000 forms of Christianity. So within uh, <laughs> the Apache, there were all kinds of Apache. You know, the, the, I, I got into the Jicarillas, which uh, I, th I think I'm pronouncing that right. But anyway, they, they were an interesting subset. Uh, and they were particular to uh, an area that I was writing in. So that, yeah, the, the research is, is fun. It's draining sometimes. I mean, someday, sometimes I'll spend a whole day reading up on something and then I'm too tired to write at the end of it. Like, oh my God, I've been reading for, you know, six hours, uh, you know, about basket weaving. I, I think I need to go play golf. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get out of the house a little bit. Have the dreaded question for you. When do you know that you've done enough research and can just write? You know, I think that just happens. I, I think that, um, well, oh, well, there's actually a different answer to that question. It's probably more accurate. I'm what they call, you know, for what, what <laughs> for whatever purpose it is, a uh, seat of your pants writer. Most of the time, I start out with the opening scene. I have an idea for the opening scene. And then I just start writing and see where it takes me. Not always, but a lot of times. Um, in, in the case of the first novel in this series, I had the screenplay based on the short story. So I knew a lot about what it was gonna be before I wrote it. Although there were new scenes and new things that happened, you know, that expanded it. But then the second one was from scratch. You know, I, I had a character and I went back, uh, let's see, how long did I go back? 14 years, something like that. Well, let's see, more than that. Yeah, but well, I went back about 20, 24 years or something like that to when he was a kid. So the, the, the second one actually begins his childhood journey. So all of that was new. You know, I didn't know any of that when I wrote the initial story or when I wrote the screenplay or when I wrote the novel. I mean, this was all... Uh, how, you know, what do I want to tell about it? What do I want to, what do I want to say about him? What do I want to say about his journey? How did his journey begin? Oh, that's a good place to start. So, you know, I just, I kind of had this opening idea and then I stumbled my way through it. So my research, to go back to your question, my research happens kind of as I go along, you know, I'll write a little bit and then I'll go, oh, I don't know enough about this to continue writing. And that's when I'll get sidetracked maybe <laughs> and and read you know more and more and more and more until i or so, sometimes it's just one little thing it's like oh what you know I, there's a there's a scene in the last one where i wanted a character to have a three-shot revolver in 1888 so i had to find out and it took a little doing uh to find a three-shot revolver find an actual three-shot revolver yeah so that I didn't just make one up, um, I found an actual one that existed and it worked perfect. So that might be something where I'm going along and I go, oh, I got to figure that out. And it might only take, you know, five, 10 minutes or 30 minutes or something. And <clears throat> then I can continue. So there are different, you know, different ways you use research, but it's, you, when I taught screenwriting, I, I always told my students two things. Well, one, I told them, to get a law degree so that they could pay for their writing. <laughs> yes, that part. <laughs> and uh, two, the R word is your friend. You know, research is your friend. It seems like something you might not want to do, especially to young writers. You know, they think they know everything, like we all did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that they don't need to do research. But, you know, I, I would harp on them that, yeah, but you get a lot out of it. You get way more out of it than you think you're going to. It may be draining, it may take a long time, but you're gonna get something out of that that you can that you use. But even if it's like I said, one thing out of a hundred, that one thing's gonna be gold for you. Yeah, it's gonna make an infinitely better story than if you hadn't. Exactly. And and you know, there's just no excuse for making stuff up. 
I mean, you know, we do. We're, you know, we're professional liars. Storytellers are professional liars. But, you know, there's a, there's a difference between, you know, making, creating a story uh, set in a real environment like the West um, or writing fantasy where, yeah, anything. I've got giant worms, and, you know, <laughs> you, you can't do that. You can't do that in fiction based in, you know, reality. Tremors, but yeah, <laughs> definitely. Unless good. there were giant worms, you know. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be purple and green alien giant worms, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, you get, you know, it's, it's, you stay within the bounds and you just can't, you just can't. I, there's so many times I'm, I'm reading something and I go, that doesn't seem right. Sometimes I'll even look it up and find out that that didn't exist, that they just made it up. And I really think it's lazy when a writer says, yeah, but it's fiction. I can make up stuff. Well, yeah, yes and no. You're making up the story. You yeah, know, you, you still are working within a reality that has to be consistent. Exactly. You, you, can't, you can't write a story in 1864 and say somebody else was president. Yeah. You know, Lincoln was president. You can't say, well, you know, FDR was president. Well, no, he really wasn't even born yet. So <laughs> not by a long shot. Yes. If you're, I mean, if you're writing fantasy, fine. This is why I don't read fantasy, by the way. But, but um, you know, if you're doing that, fine. You can do whatever you want, but you can't do it. And, and so therefore the research becomes so critical to making it believable because, you know, like me, reading something like when I'm reading something if my readers are reading something I've written and they go wait a minute a three-shot revolver those didn't they, oh they do if they look it up they'll find out it did because there's nothing worse than them looking up and go oh he made that up it was just too easy to commit it's lazy right mm -hmm. absolutely right. I really hate lazy right so now that you've kind of brought the entire he rode saga to a close on things what are you doing next well right now i'm starting I'm in, your book oh. i mean I, i'm in la in 1992 <laughs> that's <laughs> my, the current thriller i'm writing but um yeah the well i have teased something at the end of she rode number 10 um which is that the the son the, the son that honcho didn't know he had uh, has avenged, you know, something, I don't want to give it all away, but has avenged something important. And he ha he realizes kind of in the end, hey, maybe I could do this. So I'm sort of roughing, I haven't gotten there yet, but I have an idea to uh, do another 10 years, basically, in the life of the son, um, who is, uh, who's going to pick up the mantle. Very good. Okay. He'll become a uh, he'll become a little more sophisticated version of the father he never knew. Um, I, I kind of see him as a Pinkerton type or Harry Morse. If you I I have that series of Morse and Vasquez for DSP. That's something we should talk mm -hmm. about. That's yeah. that's all that's all based on reality. But um, the Harry Morse in real life became uh, kind, kind of his own Pinkerton type and was brilliant at it. He, he's considered to be the best detective of that era into the early 1900s. So I thought I might sort of pattern, um, you know, the son after that Harry Morris period where he opened his own detective shop and, you know, have the, have the kid work his way into being that person. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, with the you know, the adventures and the excitement and the bad guys and uh i can't remember if i gave him a girlfriend you know i think he has to find a new girlfriend <laughs> his wife isn't very nice in the in the last one so he's moving on let's just say <laughs> so where can people find out more about you and about your books and the multitude of different things you work on uh, Google me, I guess, you know, uh, <laughs> you actually do have a really good Google result. Yes. Yeah. There, there are a lot of links there. Put some and, time uh, on that one. Excuse me. You put some time in on that one. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. And you know, um, the, I was going to say, if you go, if you go to Amazon and you, you type Glenn A. Bruce, the easiest way to find me is, well, you can do Glenn A. Bruce, he wrote, 
and it'll take you to that book. And then, you know, at the top, there's a author, Glenn A. Bruce, you can go to that. So it's basically my page that is supposed to list all, all the books that I have out. So I, uh, she wrote is number 26 that I've had published, but they never have, have them all. I don't know what, what I keep, you know, Amazon, I keep trying to get them to add, you know, books and they'll say, well, it's added. I've said, but it's not showing up. Well, it should. And then they'll show me the link where it does show up. But if I go and try it again, it's not there. So it's a little hit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of pain that comes from all that. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with us today and going through the interview on everything. Hopefully, hope we can do this again sometime because you have a lot more to say that we haven't had a chance to get to yet. <laughs>